gonzo journalist. He was a genius. Larger than life character. Hunter, to his dying day, wanted to be thought of as an outlaw. One of the most famous writers in the world. Hunter is one of the funniest American writers in all history. Hunter S. Thompson was a man whose life was fueled by drugs, alcohol, and the desire to expose the truth about America. He represents everything that's wrong in this country. Down the line. He was worshipped by fans, loved by celebrities. But in the end, it wasn't enough. After bringing his closest family members to his home in Colorado... He went as long as he could. ...he wrote the final chapter to his amazing life. February 19th, 2005. Hunter S. Thompson is at Owl Farm, his ranch and refuge just outside of Aspen, Colorado. He's 67 years old. In just 24 hours, he'll be dead. At the beginning of his last day, Thompson's 40-year-old son, Juan, and grandson, Will, are at the farm for a visit. Also present that day is Ben Fee. Hunter's family came up to visit, and they were to stay for the weekend, and it had snowed, and Juan and Jennifer and Will were playing in the snow, and it was family time. It didn't happen very often. But underneath the seemingly innocent scene, Hunter is hiding a dark secret. This is the last time he'll be seeing his family. I think he must have known when he asked them down um, that that's when he was going to do it. But before he goes, he has a few loose ends he wants to take hey. care of. Juan! Juan! Get your ass in here, would ya? What is it, Dad? Something for you there. Thompson presents Juan with a few of his most precious hey, keepsakes. Two silver cups that are Thompson family heirlooms the box contains rare limited editions of an unpublished novel and an Aztec medallion, a reminder of Thompson's wild days. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. It's yours. Okay? He trusted Juan more than anyone. Yeah. And he knew that Juan loved him a lot. And he loved Juan a lot. I can't take that, Dad. Damn it all, I said take it. You understand what present is? The preparations for his death in less than 22 hours have begun. More than three decades before, Hunter S. Thompson exploded onto the scene when he wrote Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, a series of articles describing a drug-fueled trip across the desert. And you can read it out loud. Uh, you can, it's like poetry. It's the, the choice of words and the images and the, you know, the narrative and the voice. It's just brilliant. And he understood the, the way that writing works as a, a voice and the way it's like breathing and the, and the importance of its sound. Writing is a very intimate form of communication. You can't shout it to people because there's no sound involved. When you read something, the sound is occurring inside your own head. And it's a result of the rhythms that are created on the page. Hunter was a great student of these. Uh, these rhythms and he understood writing physically. It was fast, it was rebellious, and it was deeply shocking to mainstream America. Hunter Thompson became one of the leading figures of the 70s counterculture. His wild, drug-crazed antics, his politics, and his constant questioning of authority made him a hero for generations of young rebels across the globe. I think probably Hunter mostly will be remembered as the wild man, the drug addict, the alcoholic. He crossed divides, spending time with both the Hells Angels and President Nixon. He was immortalized as Uncle Duke in the Doonesbury cartoon strips. And twice, Hollywood came calling, turning his real-life adventures into movies. 
there were people who were big Hunter Thompson fans who had never read his work. They liked the persona. But his lasting legacy will be his writing. He broke the mold, creating a new kind of journalism, where he and drug-crazed antics became the center of the story. It was called Gonzo. By the end of his life, Thompson could look back on an incredible journey. He'd invented a whole new genre of writing, become a cultural icon, but his wild lifestyle came at a price. His body was now falling apart. A broken leg, two hip operations, and constant pain meant he could no longer live up to the legend he created. In less than 20 hours, Hunter S. Thompson will be dead. His final evening is spent in the cozy confines of his house in Colorado. I met Hunter Thompson in the winter of 2004 at a party at his house, and Hunter asked me if I'd stay up there to write and doing some filming behind the scenes, and uh, so I began going up at nights. I mean, why did we get on this game? Once you stepped into the kitchen at Owl Farm, you were in his world. You can see a, a Tiffany's clock from a close friend right next to a, a petrified beaver, Muhammad Ali's golden boxing gloves, things that you'll never see anywhere else. It's a, really quite a, a museum. Ben Fee has been living at Owl Farm for several weeks, helping Thompson write a weekly online column and recording his time spent with Thompson on videotape. Thompson's second wife, Anita, is also there. In hindsight, it was the perfect setting for Hunter. He had his son and his grandson and his daughter-in-law, and he had Anita. And those were the people who he loved more than anything at that point. And he wanted them to be around for the release of his soul. In the week before his death, Thompson wrote that for him, there were no more games, no more bombs, no more guns, no more wild fun. He'd been talking about dying for ever since I knew him, but, but talking about actually shooting himself for I, I'm something like a year and a half, telling people close to him that this is what he was going to do. He's now 67. He feels that going on is simply being greedy. All he's got to do is relax. What he's planning won't hurt a bit. It was very succinct, very brief, and it was, uh, I mean, the, the whole no more fun part is where the real meat of it is, in that Hunter realized that he just could not enjoy himself because he was physically as well as psychologically worn down like the eraser of a number two pencil. Unknown to his family, this is the last evening they will ever spend with Hunter Thompson. Sixty-seven years earlier, on July 18th, 1937, Hunter Stockton Thompson came into the world. He grew up in the conservative southern town of Louisville, Kentucky. His early childhood was, was picture perfect. Uh, one could not imagine a, a more American family existence. By the time he was a teenager, Thompson was already an important figure in his neighborhood. Lou Ann Murphy was his girlfriend. We went to movies. Uh, we went to parties in people's homes. Sometimes we just hung out on my front porch. He was very confident, had a great air of assurance, and his body language just said, you know, um, I know where I'm going. I haven't run across anybody who had the natural uh, charisma uh, that he had. You could walk into a room full of people, and the people would be gravitating to Hunter because he had a magnetism that uh, none of the rest of us had. His family wasn't rich, but Thompson wanted to be part of the Louisville elite. 
He used his charisma and early writing talent to gain access to the exclusive Athenaeum Literary Association. The Literary Association gave him entree into that elite part of Louisville society. And uh, I think he wanted desperately to be that. A lot of them would be considered top young men uh, in high school years in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, he liked that. But the picture book life changed forever when Thompson was 14. His father, who had been this gregarious, quiet, but interesting, uh, methodical individual, slowly but surely became fatigued, became ill. A debilitating neurological disease was attacking Thompson's father. Eventually, he was admitted to the local veterans' hospital. And Hunter was completely powerless to do anything about it. It was a form of torture, you might say. And he, there he was, daily, watching his father wilt, wither, die. On July 3rd, 1952, Thompson's father died. It hit the 14-year-old hard. And I remember Hunter coming to my house at, at twilight. And uh, we sat on our front porch for a long, long time. And then he would get up and pace. And uh, I think he was just stunned. An angry young Hunter Thompson started to lash out, vandalizing property and causing havoc around town. He drank more than some of us did. And he had such a wonderful imagination. Uh, instead of just drinking, uh, he would want to go and do things, and some of the things were, were, not, were not great. He pushed over mailboxes and smashed light bulbs and got drunk, you know, and chased after women and, he, 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 and, and didn't go to school. He was fairly innocent, prankish, boyish behavior, uh, which he sustained to the end of his life. But now, Thompson, 52 years later, can feel his own body falling apart. He's in constant pain, and he's made up his mind. His death will not be slow and lingering. It's the middle of the night at Hunter S. Thompson's farm in Colorado. He has less than 16 hours to live. His family has come for the weekend and are now gathered in the living room along with his second wife, Anita. They've been married for several years. At times, it's a volatile relationship. Tricky dicky to kick around you are. Hunter and Anita, they, they had their battles. They had their, uh, their spats and their wars and yelling matches. They were like the, the guns of Sid and Nancy. They could, they could really have a go, but then, you know, they just, they'd love each other right afterwards. But tonight, Hunter is far from being the peacemaker. He and his wife are on a collision course. Dr. Gary Kennedy is a psychiatrist who specializes in the effects of old age. With increasing age, and especially with people that become physically frail, a heavy alcohol intake has a direct effect on the brain. And what's important here is those effects can make one less conscious, less aware of the effect that your behavior is having on other people. He's a very big human being, full spectrum. And that all the, the wonderful, exciting, good, kind, generous, all of that was absolutely true. Not loaded. I don't care. What do you mean it's not loaded? You're, you're drunk. How do you know the dark it's not side of her was really bad. He was vicious. The fear, you know, of, of having a gun point at you, it's pretty terrifying. So, uh, that, that shook Anita. This was not fun. This was not a fun person. This was, this was a, a really pained, angry, um, tortured man. Hunter's antics have started a row with his wife that will simmer for the remaining hours of his life. I 
41 years before, Hunter S. Thompson had left the stuffiness of Louisville, Kentucky far behind and was living in San Francisco with his first wife, Sondi, and their infant son. I, I was very happy to be a mother. I had these two men in my life that I was madly in love with both. And so I, it, was, it was a very happy time for me. Thompson decided to dedicate his life to writing. He began traveling, writing freelance articles for a variety of small magazines and newspapers. He wanted to be a really good writer, you know, and, and he was so disciplined. I mean, he was very disciplined. He wrote every day. Um, he, he rewrote everything. When, when I typed something for him, I mean, it had to be straight edges, you know, I mean, and there couldn't be any mistakes. It was well done. It was re-edited, re-edited, the, the, exactly the right word. That was his idea of writing. Thompson struggled to make a living, but he was determined to make it as a writer. In the spring of 1965, he started an ambitious project, an inside account of what was then a little-known motorcycle gang, the Hells Angels. We had the angels over to the house, and I'm thinking, you know, these are these are nice people, you know, these are they're they're not boring and they're not insurance agents, you know, they're they're really not they're kind of okay people. But I didn't realize that they were, you know, they were also dealing drugs, they were killing people, all kinds of stuff. But I didn't know that. After a year of research, Thompson wrote Hell's Angels, a strange and terrible saga of the outlaw motorcycle gang. And he had to be careful with these guys. Um, and, and he was. When the book was published, the Hell's Angels wanted a cut of the money. When Thompson refused, they beat him to within an inch of his life. He was stomped. And um, really fortunately, you know, one of the guys, great big, huge guy, got him out just in the nick of time. You know, because Hunter could easily have been killed. But the literary critics were kinder. They loved the book. Finally, after years of rejection, Thompson had his first success. Hunter just, I'd never heard him. You know, he, he had been a kind of an unsuccessful journalist for many years, sports writer, pretty much a scuffling and getting a lot of rejections and failure for 10 years. He, he was not a success. And he came out with this book called Hell's Angels, and it was stunning. You know, it was just a magnificent book, and i have never read anything like it before. But at the same time Thompson was beginning his literary career, he was also beginning a long-standing relationship with drugs. I remember very, very well the first time Hunter took acid. I didn't have a clue about what this would mean, but I have a little boy in a crib, and I was terrified. I was just terrified that Hunter was going to be violent. And then he asked me for the gun. And I said, no. And he said, I want the gun. If you don't give me the gun, I'm throwing this boot through that window. And he did. And I was just really scared. Mostly I was scared for Juan. You know, I, I didn't know what might happen. And I reached up, you know, under 6'3", I'm five, four and a half. I reached up and just clawed. I mean, here the guy's on acid, you know, and I took my fingers and I just clawed his face, I actually drew blood. Thompson's next big literary assignment was an article on the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago. But demonstrations outside the convention center soon turned ugly. The police used tear gas, dogs, and brute force to break up the crowd. Thompson, the young journalist, was caught in the middle. He was in the crowds, and he saw many pe people beaten, um, some people that he knew, and he just, um, and he saw the policemen beating, beating, beating these, you know, mostly young people. 
When he came back, I only saw Hunter cry twice in 19 years. He cried. He was telling me the story of how everyone was getting beaten, and it, it made a huge difference to him. Thompson himself said the battles with police were a turning point. Years later, he proclaimed in Rolling Stone that that week in Chicago was worse than the most grotesque acid trip, that it permanently changed his whole chemistry. Suddenly, it became essential to confront those who had slithered their way into power and were causing these things to happen. He was deeply offended about what was happening in America. As, he, as, we, as most thinking people are, it's a great dream, America, but the, the reality is really uh, upsetting frequently to people who uh, can see the options and the possibilities. You are on our property, which you are defacing. If you do not leave, you will be subject to arrest. Yeah, he was, he was cared a lot about America. He was a real, you know, he was a Southern boy. He was an American. Thompson was determined to somehow get into politics. When he moved his family north to Aspen, Colorado, he got his opportunity. He was asked to run for sheriff. He jumped at the chance to showcase his very own brand of politics. It was different from a campaign would be now because there's an already established liberalist uh, view of law enforcement in town. Back then, uh, the, the sheriff before Hunter, Carol Whitmire, was a, you know your classic cowboy redneck sheriff. You know, marijuana laws are one of the reasons. That has uh, engendered this lack of respect that the uh, that cops complain about all over the country. I think it's a good thing that Hunter Thompson is running, because I think it makes us all aware of the power that's involved in the job. At least they have some new ideas, which is more than the old people. Thompson advocated planting grass in the town streets and punishing people who sold bad drugs. Michael Solheim was his campaign manager. We would start with stuff like that, but then we would build into the ideas about uh, the control of growth in this town. We were out doing um, uh, meetings around town, mostly in the evenings at the various lodges and stuff, and, and inviting all the Aspenites to come and, and meet Hunter and, and listen to what his ideas are. Remarkably, Thompson's campaign seemed to be gaining ground. I remember one night we were sitting upstairs up there, and, and uh, that was the day that it first occurred to us that we might win the damn thing. I said, what are we going to do if we win? <laughs> OK, here's These the total. Right yeah. Whitmire, 204, Hunter, 173. Aww. In the end, Thompson lost by less than 500 votes. <laughs> It's, it's very hard to, you know, to have a bald-headed lunatic. I'll do that for the cameras. Uh, I was, All right. I've already made up my mind, as a matter of fact. This is my last trip in, in politics, or this kind of politics. I assure you I'll be in other kind of politics. I'm not sure which way I'll go, but it'll be one or the other. It won't be down this middle anymore. Once the running for office thing was behind, he preferred to be plodding up an owl farm and, you know, moving the pieces from behind the scenes. Uh, but, well, he, you know, when lending his celebrity to a cause would actually do some good, he wasn't, wouldn't hesitate to do so. Thompson would never run for office again, but for the rest of his life, he used his writing as a platform to rail against the establishment. It's the early hours of the morning. Hunter Thompson is alone. He's in constant pain. He has 14 hours before he will choose to end his life. Well, physically, he was in crummy shape. You know, he'd had, he'd had a surgery or two, and, you know, the, the, the bad broken leg and all that stuff takes a toll on, uh, on anyone that age. So, yeah, he was in crummy shape. At 3 AM, Thompson calls Ben Fee and Juan. Hey, Benny. He wants company. What are you guys doing? Night is young. 
and it occasioned us taking painkillers, which were not any better for him than they are for anybody else. And, you know, lots of painkillers make you depressed, and they kind of make your situation seem Thanks. more and more uh, trapped. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. And Juan and I went over and sat with Hunter for a long time, for several more hours. He had a moment where he was scared that he was going to have his freedom stripped, his, uh, his ability to live the way he enjoyed to live, uh, you know, with, with guns open on the counter. So we read his old works and uh, tried to keep it light and upbeat, get his mind off of it. You could strike anywhere. There was that sense of inevitable victory. It was about 7 in the morning when Hunter went to bed. Juan if he ever feared for his father's life. He didn't seem to believe that it was right around the corner. Juan knew his father and knew how it would end, but I, I don't think Juan saw it coming up like it did. Thirty-five years earlier, Hunter S. Thompson changed the face of journalism. He returned to the city of his birth, Louisville, to cover the Kentucky Derby for Scanlon's magazine. As the deadline for the article approached, the magazine became anxious to get their copy. And they said, you have to send us something. He said, I don't have anything. All I have is garbage. And they said, we have to send it. I can't. It's just... It's not lucid. They said, send it to us. He sent it to them, and they said, this is great. Even though Thompson wasn't convinced by his new style, others saw it as a breakthrough. My view is that it actually was quite a polished piece. It was just a rather of a radical style. And it was consistent with a kind of journalism that was getting more and more radical, starting with Norman Mailer on the steps of the Pentagon and Armies of the Night and Tom Wolfe, you know, the acid Kool-Aid test and this kind of personal journalism where you put yourself in the story and you write in the voice, the narrative voice that you, that you, you recognize. Sex, drugs and rock and roll narrative voice. It was like the way people talk. Thompson's new style was a break from his previous work. It was considered so unique it was given a name, gonzo journalism. Whether accidental or planned, Thompson's gonzo style became more concrete in 1971, when he took a long, drug-frenzied journey from California to Las Vegas with attorney Oscar Acosta. They're somewhere in the deserts outside Barstow, California, when the cocktail of drugs explodes in his brain. Suddenly, even the simple act of driving becomes fraught with frightening visions. The audio hallucinates a terrible roar, while all around what looks like huge bats are swooping and screeching. Thompson screams, holy Jesus, what are these goddamn animals? <laughs> what Thompson had put to paper was wild, manic, and like nothing anyone else was writing. He's still ogling and groping the American dream, that pale, exhausted vision of the big winner stumbling like a drunk out of an impassive and stale Vegas casino. The articles he wrote were turned into a novel, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Hunter Thompson was just 34 years old, and already he'd created a classic. He could cut to the sort of essence of the truth of uh, what was going on by fictional techniques such as metaphor or imagination or fantasy. He was brilliant, absolutely. But more than that, he'd created a fictional Hunter S. Thompson, the wild, drug-taking, bourbon-swilling gonzo journalist at the center of the book. As Thompson grew older, he would find it increasingly difficult to play that character. After a short sleep, Hunter S. Thompson rolls out of bed. In four hours, he'll take his own life. Hey, his wife, Anita, is doing her best to forget the fight of the night before. She gets ready to drive into town for a yoga class. 
It's Mr. Booby. Good morning, Mr. Booby. Okay, well, you have a nice day too. The day begins like Thompson's days have for much of the last 50 years, with liberal amounts of alcohol. Diggity dog. Protein. We're good. It's very, very difficult to separate the writer from the bourbon drinker, and it never, ever stopped. And it went on to his dying day. It was, it was uh, an essential part of him. He was what I would call a professional drinker, and of course a famous uh, drug user in a, uh, what I would call an intelligent way, that he wasn't a crash and burn sort of a guy. Uh, look, last night, is that it? I, I'm sorry. At breakfast, Thompson tries to apologize to his wife, You're Anita, for pointing You're the gun at her the night before. Control. What? You know it was I... very difficult to live with Hunter. It was exciting. It was, at times, really loving and romantic. Um, but I would say, most of the time, it was very hard. Because, mostly because Hunter was so angry. This was an impulsive person. Attract and command attention was a subject of adulation. He was novel. He was original. Uh, but with age, that impulsiveness ceases to be so, uh, so much of an advantage. And when you no longer have the, uh, the emotional high that comes from that kind of attention, how do you replace that? I've been out of control for 50 years. I mean, what's, what's new? I gotta get out of here. I'm going to the gym. As his wife leaves, she has no idea that this will be the last time she will see him alive. Thirty-three years earlier, after the great success of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Rolling Stone magazine sent their new star on the road again. The assignment was to cover the 1972 US presidential campaign. We now elect today and elect George McGovern and defeat Richard Nixon. I'm concerned there was a feeling that this was an election that could defeat Nixon, that something exciting might happen. There wasn't such a clear distinction between the music and the politics. The music was going to set us free. That was, that was our motto. This time we're going to win! Thompson was supposed to bring the rock and roll mentality to the campaign. Richard Nixon represents the dark side of the American dream. Richard Nixon stands to me for everything that I not only have contempt for, but dislike and think should be stomped out. Greed, treachery, stupidity, cupidity. Nixon represents everything that's wrong with this country. I mean, Down the line. He can't even walk. You know, he walks around with this kind of, uh, how are you? I'm Richard Nixon. Tim Ferriss was an editor with Rolling Stone. A button he had printed up once said, you know, I'm not like the others. He wasn't like the rest of the press corps. Even conservative American political figures like Pat Buchanan, you know, would say that Hunter was writing the funniest stuff about politics they'd ever read. It was really astonishing material. Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail 72 was a collection of stories Thompson wrote about the race. It was supposed to be released immediately after the election, but Alan Rinsler, Thompson's editor, was getting increasingly worried about the deadline. He and I had exchanged really hostile letters uh, prior to this meeting because I'm an intrusive kind of do what's needed to be done kind of hands-on editor. I, I didn't want to just wait for him. I, I knew he was notoriously late with everything. Uh, and what I realized ultimately was that he was not going to write this book. He was not going to finish it uh, on time. I would have to actually sit with him the entire time. Food was brought in constantly. But he didn't eat much because he was taking so much speed and cocaine. It was a non-stop, you know, 72 hours at a stretch, collapse, 72 more at a stretch, collapse kind of experience. And we had tape machines in those days. People would come pick up the tapes, rush away to the office, and, and work all night transcribing the tapes or all day, and uh, bring back the pages. And that was the kind of way you had to work to get it done with Hunter. Not only was Rinsler dealing with a writer who found it hard to write, 
He was also dealing with an author who was finding it increasingly difficult to find his groove. He tried to tune up his mind through drugs and alcohol to the point where he was having, like, grandiose visions and, 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 and flights of tremendous creative imagination. I mean, it's true. And he'd try to capture that. But then he would, there'd be too much of it, and then he'd start, to, he'd start to turn to jelly, and he couldn't think straight at all. Finally, after a huge consumption of narcotics and a great deal of help from his editor, the book was written. Once again, it was a success, but from here on, the writing got harder. I've been with a lot of writers, and it's, it's hard for everybody, but for Hunter, it got harder and harder. It was a hard act. He was himself a hard act to follow. The drink and drugs that had once inspired Thompson became a permanent fixture and, bit by bit, began to rot his brain. Absolutely. You can't do that forever. Uh, he, he was a big, strong guy, and he had a high tolerance. But after uh, 40 years, 40, 50 years of steady, daily, never being sober, it, I think it gets to you. A lot of people I know from that era either died or disintegrated or straightened out. After more than 30 years of fighting against the political tide of the United States, Thompson is preparing to withdraw from the race once and for all. It's February 20th, 2005. Hunter S. Thompson has gathered his family for one last weekend at his ranch in Aspen, Colorado. On the last morning of his life, his knee hurts, his hips hurt, his back is sore. In two hours, he will shoot himself. Well, Hunter was extremely free. Um, uh, he insisted on his freedom, and he exercised his freedom to a degree that's unknown to most mortals on a day-by-day -day basis. And I'm not just talking about freedom of speech, but freedom of action. And when that freedom began to be limited, by the fact that he couldn't walk right, that he was in physical pain from a, a bad back and back surgery, bad knee and stuff, bad broken leg. Um, I think the thing that most troubled him about it was uh, the prospect of uh, that he was he was looking at a permanent narrowing of his uh, of his freedom. He'd been you know blessed with an athlete's body all his life, and all of a sudden it all kind of starts to fold up at once over a short period of time. Is 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 you know going to be a horrible blow to anyone so his you know it's his, his physical problems were a, a big part of uh, his life at that point he types a cryptic word on his typewriter it's the last thing he will ever write its meaning remains a riddle It's 3.30, February 20th, 2005. Thompson calls his neighbor, Ed Bastian. Hey, Teddy, get over here. Four over here, right? There's gonna be some shooting. <laughs> Hunter was someone who never expected to be 30 years old, much less 40 or 50. He lived his life knowing that he was living dangerously and um, enjoying himself on a day-by-day -day -day basis. It was all, he always emphasized that it was fine with him if he didn't live a long life. And as he got older, he often said that he wasn't afraid to commit suicide, that this, this was a kind of an exit door that he regarded as being perfectly defensible. Hunter S. Thompson has just two hours left to live. <coughs> 26 years earlier, Thompson published The Great Shark Hunt. The book is a collection of his best writing stretching back to the early 60s. Thompson was only 41 years old, but already he was writing a retrospective. He compares it to etching words onto his own tombstone. There seems nothing left. He said all there is to say. Beyond, he can foresee nothing but a quick exit straight down, right off his 28th floor hotel terrace. No one could follow up his act. 
let alone Hunter S. Thompson. Well, as you read his chronology throughout his career, one of the things that made him great was he took risks. He went into areas that were not necessarily safe for journalists, from his first work in Hell's Angels to the Chicago Convention, and that riskiness paid off with his creativity, but also with that risk went a self-destructive strength. Thompson continued to write articles for Rolling Stone, but nothing he did could win the same critical acclaim of his earlier works. Once you've written Hell's Angels and Fear and Loathing, I mean, you gotta keep raising the bar. But Hunter's particular psyche and personality, he was, you know, insecure and he was, uh, you know, he, would, he, he, he was very uh, anxious all the time. So the money, the fame, the hallucinogenics, those are all different ingredients. And um, so Hunter began to morph. <laughs> he had to change a bit. I had lived to help him be this great writer. Well, this great writer wasn't writing, and he wasn't writing great things. And what am I doing? Sondi, Thompson's wife for over 15 years, had had enough of the Hunter Thompson circus and left. I, I had no sense of myself. I, I, I didn't think I could do anything. I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't this enough. I wasn't good enough. So when I, when I left, I still loved Hunter, but I just, there was no way that I could, that I could live this life anymore. Thompson had become known as much for his excessive behavior as for his writing. Hunter S. Thompson, the writer, became more and more Hunter S. Thompson, the character. Man, you know, when there'd be a, an event with a lot of people at Olive Farm, Hunter would put on his sunglasses and the cigarette holder and the visor, and he'd become that public persona. You know, and the, those of us who were closest to him would kind of back off and let the fans move in. Ladies and gentlemen, Hunter S. Thompson! Thompson began to cash in on his notoriety charging large fees to appear in front of crowds of adoring students. I saw him speak at Cal once, and he, was, he got up on the stage, he was so drunk, he just fell over and passed out. And people had paid a lot of money, and he was paid t something like 25 grand to do that. He was on the stage for like six minutes. And that was his public persona for, for many of his public appearances. I remember once Hunter was uh, cited and had I think had to pay a fine for setting off a fire extinguisher on stage uh, at some talk he was giving somewhere. And, and uh, he told me rather sheepishly that, I, I said, well, you know, why did you do that? And didn't you know that it was, you know, there are statutes against it now? And he said, well, I, I thought it was uh, expected of me. <laughs> but Thompson's wild antics weren't just for his public appearances. I'm gonna blow the hell out of him. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> One of his favorite things was to get a gallon jar and fill it with gasoline. I'm gonna move your gloves up, man. They're gonna goddamn get go wet. You know that. <laughs> and there were these little exploding targets. But he'd attach them to a gallon of gasoline. The first time, he says, Michael, go into the uh, living room and get a fire extinguisher. I go to get the fire extinguisher. And I'm standing about 20 feet away. He says, no, stand right here behind me. I said, Hunter, if I stand here and you catch fire, I'm going to catch fire. <laughs> so I'll just stand over there. He gave me a really disgusted look. was big, breaking glass. Yeah, blowing things up. Yeah, that's, that's violence. That's chaos. The first time I met him, he actually handed me, I'll never forget this, a, a fistful of lit Roman candles. 
They were lit. He said, here, wrestler, hold this. You know, and it was like, if you're gonna play with me, you gotta be fearless. And so I took them, and then they went off and just shot into the air. Yeah, Hunter loved loud noises and th explosions and unexpected things. There's a theory about uh, drug abuse and alcohol abuse that, in a sense, when you, when you start using, you stop growing internally, and you don't mature, you don't develop as an adult. You're stuck in 16, 17, 18. And in many ways, I believe that's the key to Hunter's personality. He was a big kid. His public appearances and outrageous behavior did nothing to tarnish his reputation. In the late 90s, his most famous book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, became a Hollywood movie starring Johnny Depp. And when John Kerry ran for president in 2004, he could still invoke Thompson's name. Of the informers put you at ease. Vice President Hunter Thompson. <laughs> But even though Kerry could use Thompson's name to get a laugh, Thompson hadn't been taken seriously as either a political commentator or a writer in years. Later on, as politics moved in its course and the country changed, um, to keep on with that kind of political commentary would have required learning quite a lot about how the landscape was changing, and Hunter wasn't really interested in doing that. I don't think the books were very good, the, the last bunch of books. He, did, he got into kind of an ESPN sports writing thing that was kind of hack work. He just couldn't keep it up, and I think that starting in 1982 or 3, for the last 20 years of his life, his work was just to make a living and to... Uh, uh, provide a new product for publishers who were willing to pay him large advances because anything that with his name on it would sell. But the quality of his work, I think, really after 1982, just became repetitious and uh, flat. As the years dragged on, Thompson's writing was becoming increasingly irrelevant. As old age set in, he would rely on his favorite gun, a 45 Smith & Wesson, to make his final statement to the world. It's late afternoon. Hunter S. Thompson has less than half an hour left to live. Hello. Hi, it's me. His wife, Anita, calls from a local fitness club. Once again, Thompson apologizes for his behavior the night before. This is the last conversation Hunter Thompson will ever have. Hunter was speaking with Anita on the phone, and uh, they were reconciling, and uh, he, was, he was speaking with her and telling her that everything was gonna be okay. Elsewhere in the house, Thompson's son Juan watches over his own son, six-year-old Will. Stop it. How you doing? Yeah, I'm at the gym. I'm finishing up. This is a sea of gonzo thongs, I hope? Yes. Well, listen, babe, I'm sorry about last night. Okay, I'm sorry, but uh, I really love you. Come on home, will you? Okay, I love you too. Hunter? 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 What's wrong? No. Juan blew past me and so I was on my way over. Why does it ghost? I had no idea, but I, I could tell that something wasn't right. I was with uh, Bob Bradis, our uh, sheriff, and Bob got a call from one of his uh, deputies saying that there'd been a gunshot out at Hunter's. And we all looked at each other and just knew that was it. That was it. Jennifer and Will were horribly shaken. It was so surreal and, and shocking. Uh, I stepped closer and 
one interrupted me and he, he grabbed me and said, don't, just go. don't come closer, please. Go. My son to this day uh, and my daughter-in-law both feel that they are glad that they were there to take care of things and also to see him and, and feel his body and so that it was very, very real. Hunter S. Thompson died at 5.45 p.m., February 20th, 2005. He was 67 years old. He was born a genius, and he was born with that charisma. And he was also born with that tortured soul. And where that comes from, I don't know.